really excited to be chatting with you all again. Let me click over to my slides. So uh, what we're talking about today is basically like a kind of new feature engineering uh, paradigm that we see be pretty useful for uh, teams that are building real-time decisioning systems and particularly for fraud detection, risk type decisions. And so I, I want to talk through that. I'll kind of introduce some concepts along the way. Uh, and, you know, we'll have some Q&A at the end. So if you got questions, we'll go through that. But let's start with like, what is the risk decisioning problem? The main, you know, problem that we uh, ML teams try to solve. You have some data, uh, you got an ML model, um, you're trying to generate a risk score. Often this is in real time. There's something that happens in between. So like what happens in between here? Well, you know, we're building features. That's the whole idea. We're building a variety of features based on our data that can provide the right information to our ML models so that we can make the right risk uh, prediction. <clears throat> it's not as simple as this because we also have to uh, train our model. So all of these features, they also have to become fill, uh, fit into training data sets that are accurate. You know, you've probably dealt with this problem or seen somebody talk about this problem uh, many times. And so there's there's effectively two uh, consumption places, two points of consumption for feature data, model serving and model training. And they're kind of different. One is real time and on one data point at a time. One is batch. Uh, one is slow. It's on a lot of different data at the same time it needs to be point in time correct. Uh, so this is a little bit of a feature engineering challenge or data engineering challenge. Uh, but what, like when we say feature, like what do we mean by this? Like what is this feature thing? Um, so, you know, a feature is something that implements this interface. And I'm kind of building up to, I'm going to describe uh, like a new way to do some feature engineering. So, uh, so it's this interface. What's the interface? Okay, uh, you know, need data for predictions. So inference, so serving feature for inference uh, and serving feature data for training. And obviously also like reading the raw data in the business and, you know, there's some transformation step that happens in here and you have in your model, you have lots of features. Uh, there's a couple other things as part, you might want to consider as part of this uh, interface. So, you know, I need to backfill a feature at the bottom here. So like I create a new feature, I need to get all the historical values for it. And then a variety of like management and maintenance stuff. Can I register, share, monitor this feature? Okay. So, so far, so good. Uh, what are some kinds of features? So some examples of features that uh, we often see used in uh, uh, risk models. Uh, so, so one group is dimensions. So this is kind of just like a basic lookup. Hey, what country is this user in? Pretty easy. That could be a useful feature. Uh, representations. So uh, embeddings about a user, embeddings about a merchant, let's say. Aggregations are a really big one. Lifetime aggregations. So how much money has this person spent with us in their whole life? Time window aggregations. How many transactions did this person make in the last five minutes? Uh, you know, if it's a thousand, maybe that's very obviously fraud. Uh, session aggregations. How many, how many, uh, you know, pages has this person viewed in this current session that they're in? And then a variety of other kinds. There's a little bit of like a miscellaneous bucket, but uh, the theme is like real-time logic is being applied. So policy logic, like, um, is this transaction permitted in this state or in this country or something like that? So applying some policies, uh, third-party lookups, like looking, uh, you know, let me uh, ask my uh, identity verification provider uh, what they think about this person. So that's referring to like an external system and also like featureizing user inputs. The user just put in some, in, you know, just signed up for insurance with us and they input a bunch of data. So let's run some uh, featureization on that data as well. So this is like a, a bunch of different types of uh, features. Uh, let's talk about, just as an example, we'll talk about this aggregations bucket. And I'm gonna talk through aggregations as an example for the rest of this talk. But what we talk about applies to uh, many of the, like kind of like all kinds of different features. So if I wanna build uh, and implement like a real-time aggregation as an ML feature, Today, what do I do, right? Like, what's the kind of status quo way to implement this? Well, there's a couple of requirements. So, and this is for like a really, you know, uh, productionized industry grade uh, 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 data pipelines that power an ML application. So number one, we need it to be fresh. We need the data to be uh, up to date and served in real time. So it's both the data is fresh and also it's delivered quickly. It needs to be easy to develop, 
we, we can't uh, make it hard for our engineers or our data scientists to create this stuff. We need to go fast. It needs to be cost efficient. Sometimes this stuff operates at crazy scale, so cost efficiency is important. It needs to be consistent. Online and offline, the data needs to be the same. Otherwise, you're going to run into skew issues, train serve skew issues that will make your model, effectively your model performance uh, uh, degraded. Needs to be reliable for production. Needs, you know, this thing can't go down. It's powering your fraud models. Let's say you're not okay with taking on any dependency that's going to uh, bring this thing down. And backfills have to be super easy. When you can backfill easily, then you can make, um, uh, you can iterate with new features really quickly. So it's really hard to uh, do all of this, right? Build a pipeline, build you know a feature pipeline that can get all of this stuff done. It's actually even hard to get like three. Or, or more than three of these implemented, and uh, and so like the you know the Nirvana state is to get like all of them uh, supported. So let's kind of look at like how someone might do this today. Uh, so for example, uh, you know transaction count for a user in the past thirty minutes. So that sounds like the simplest kind of like possible feature to define um, in terms of like it's a really simple definition. Uh, so let's look at how that can be implemented. So this is how, you know, someone might do that. They might connect to their payment microservice, you know, uh, send that, send payment inf transaction information to Postgres, set up a SQL query to query Postgres upon a trigger, upon the model serving, asking them for some data, running that query and, and delivering that data to the model service, model serving. And then also would deliver that transaction data into Kafka. Kafka would log it to S3. And then you, you'd kind of define, configure, orchestrate a Spark job to uh, run against that S3 data and understand the data and generate point in time accurate versions of this data to, to uh, output um, uh, training data. And then you do this for every feature, right? So it's a lot of stuff. Um, it's obviously a lot of stuff. It's kind of like, whoa, that's a lot for me to implement uh, one feature. Uh, but let's look at like what's actually hard about this, right? Uh, one, you know, I need to make this cost efficient, especially if I'm running this stuff at scale. Uh, two is I have two implementations to manage here now. Uh, I got two different pipelines that have to be uh, uh, that have to have the consistent data. You know, that have to. Uh, this is the train serve skew point. The data coming that I'm uh, making doing inferences with has to be the same as the data I'm doing uh, model training with. I got to make sure this stuff, these query runs fast enough uh, and runs fast enough at peak times and at scale and all the uh, variety of uh, kind of engineering, production engineering concerns that we might have. How do I get this stuff to be point in time accurate? I need to make sure there's no leakage uh, and, and the time travel happens accurately. And then someone needs to kind of like provision, monitor and own all of this stuff. So it's a lot of stuff to get done. Um, and it's kind of like, when you look at this, you're not thinking, oh, my ML team is going to go super fast. But we had this, you know, I just showed you this nice diagram with this cool uh, feature box, and uh, it didn't look as scary as this. So what happened to this, uh, nice, this nice thing? Well, you know, ML companies, uh, top ML companies, they can go pretty fast with ML. And so what do they do? Like, how do they, how do they accomplish this without having to build this every time? So what they do is uh, they use feature platforms. They have infrastructure that they that they have in their companies that makes it really easy for people to engineer uh, features and deploy them to production. And so, a little bit of quick trivia: you know, my team built uh, all of the the ML platform uh, at Uber. It's called Michelangelo. We had pretty sophisticated uh, feature platform there, um, and I used to actually work on the one at Google too. Uh, but but at Tecton, we have you know folks from all of all of these companies who've kind of interacted with this stuff at uh, one point or another. Uh, but these you know top, especially Fang companies, they have this stuff. They have a lot of people working on this stuff. Uh, so they have feature platforms, uh, and those provide clean APIs for developing, operating, and managing features. Basically, making it easy to implement and interact with feature according to that interface we just talked about, right? So, uh, you know, get feature online, uh, get value offline, and then some of the other stuff around, you know, allowing a data scientist to manage this thing easily. Register the feature, share it, you know, deploy or backfill the feature, uh, 
uh, all of that kind of stuff. Monitor you could put here too. They also have, um, so let's actually take a step back here. So, so this feature though, so while this makes it, this kind of solves a problem about like interacting with the feature and defining or, or and registering and managing a feature, it doesn't really say much about like, how do I actually build this core feature uh, pipeline? This core feature pipeline is um, maybe quite complicated and maybe that's where a lot of the complexity lives, right? Like for example, all of the stuff we just saw about how to build a, an aggregation feature. So what these companies do is they also uh, build feature engines, which are basically um, uh, pre-built implementations of common powerful features. So uh, imagine like a managed feature. So you can build your own custom feature pipeline, but then they have these managed feature pipelines that make it really easy to get a really high quality feature uh, built and productionized really quickly. So I want to talk about this concept of feature engines, show you an example of it and how it can speed up ML and your risk team, your fraud ML team. Uh, so let's get into that. So, uh, you know, they can make it really easy to build, productionize uh, powerful uh, feature pipelines. And you can imagine different groups of uh, features, different categories of features, effectively having different kind of like feature engines associated with them. So think of it as like different template feature pipelines that are already built and optimized to support these kinds of features. So let's talk about this aggregations engine. We're going to stay on aggregations uh, today. So instead of doing, you know, this whole thing that we just talked about, about building an implementation in Postgres, building another one in a Kafka S3, and, you know, figuring out all of these details and then figuring out how to backfill this data and validate and monitor, uh, you know, validate, monitor all of this data to get this thing. Uh, it's way nicer if you have this opportunity. So this has lots of code. It's duplicate implementations. Um, you know, engineering needs to be really involved and it takes a lot of time. It's like, this is why it takes months to get something built in into production. But it's a lot nicer if you can have a single definition. Um, so it's just like one file to configure, define and configure this stuff. And you, you get all of those requirements we looked at before out of the box, right? It's automatically productionized. It's online, offline consistent. It, it supports backfills. It works at any scale in a cost efficient way. And it's super fast, freshness uh, and serving latency less than 100 milliseconds. And in the Tekton implementation of all this stuff that we have, we got a bunch of bonuses, automated monitoring, one step to production. Uh, but the point is that uh, if, you, if you can adopt a feature engine um, a pattern, then you have very few components to manage. And you, you can create uh, a feature engineering experience that's self-serve for data scientists all the way to production. And you can productionize instantly. And so it's a really nice unlock for uh, risk teams, for fraud teams. And I'll say that the vast majority of Tekton's customers that use, uh, that are solving fraud or risk problems use uh, our feature engines, especially actually for aggregations, because aggregations are one of the hardest problems to solve. Uh, so let's look at, you know, like what, what does this deliver? And it enables, if you do it right, simple and fast feature engineering workflow. And it combines it with industry grade performance and reliability and simple enterprise management. So how can we get all of that, right? Uh, you know, I've been talking about this thing, but what actually is it? Let's, let's look at what, what it is as an example, and then we can imagine how that can work for other types of features as well. So, you know, instead of generic feature, let's talk about aggregation feature. Uh, it hides the simple interface Right, the simple definition um, allows, if we implement it well, uh, is is really easy to create and author these features. So, uh, for example, there's two steps, and this is an, a Tekton example. There's two steps to define a, uh, an aggregation feature in Tekton. One is defining some SQL that operates against a stream, you know, your transaction stream, and that filters the data and and pro, uh, does projection and filtering in an appropriate way. And then step two is defining different aggregations. So aggregation one is the average amount over the past time delta one hour. So average amount over one hour. And the second aggregation is the average amount over the past 12 hours. So really simple. We, we wrote this one snippet of code and we got uh, effectively a productionized performant and co cost optimized managed feature pipeline. So what does that mean? It means 
uh, simple definition, you get transaction data in, feature values out that meet the feature interface that we've been talking about. And it comes with a bunch of engineering best practices, best practice implementations behind the scenes. And now let's look at that. Like, what is that? What is that actually? So in the case of aggregations, and I'm talking a little bit about like what, what Tekton's aggregation feature engine does, uh, but this is a specific example. Uh, there's a step to, uh, it's kind of like a pre-built feature engineering pipeline. So um, uh, there's a SQL step that runs against the stream that selects, uh, that selects uh, events from the stream. There's a tiling step that pre-aggregates filter data into tiles. And that data is automatically brought into various online offline stores. Uh, to store these partial aggregates. Then there's a compaction step to uh, compact the partial aggregates to, uh, across time to save storage and, and, uh, and speed up retrieval. And then there's a real time when, you know, when you're querying uh, the features, there's a real time roll up, which will, which will uh, aggregate across these different tiles to make it very uh, efficient to you know deliver the right feature value at the right time while minimizing the amount of operations that have to happen at serving time. It's a lot of stuff. It's uh, like a whole bunch of engineering that happens, a whole bunch of um, uh, performance optimizations that are built in there, and you kind of get that for free by just you know writing that uh, uh, that nice um, configuration we looked at in the previous slide. Another way to look at it, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it's kind of a little bit like heavy visually. Um, but you get this kind of like this automated tiling and compaction optimization gives you this performance without compromising on accuracy. So it's the, the, the beauty of this pipeline is behind the scenes, it, uh, it implements like a very advanced uh, feature engineering pipeline. And so what we're seeing here, this is just another way to look at what's going on. There's a bunch of events coming from your stream source. And this is kind of vertical as time. So now, four days ago. And then those events are aggregated into, they're kind of like pre-aggregated into tiles. Those tiles are compacted into different uh, levels of granularity that are, cho that are chosen based on kind of the definitions. And then the real-time feature server is rolling up all these tiles and some events to allow for highly accurate but very fast aggregations to be able to be served, computed on demand uh, for inference. So that, again, it's a, a lot of stuff. It's very advanced. It's not something that like the data science, the data scientist who's on a uh, on a, a really intense deadline is gonna like whip this up and it's gonna be uh, perform like performant and reliable for production. So it's the value. Of, it's the beauty of having like a, a feature engine, which is a pre-built, pre-optimized pipeline that is makes it easy to configure. So why use one of these feature engines? The hard data engineering is automated and out of the way. Super fast to build, iterate, and deploy. It runs really fast in real time. The ML problems, like the time travel and the online offline consistency and, the, and the skew and leakage, that's kind of automated for you as well. And it comes with all these performance um, uh, optimizations and cost optimizations. Uh, and you don't need an eng team. There's no engineering uh, person needed in the core iteration flow uh, where a data scientist is defining a feature and then reading a feature uh, or, or deploying a feature. And so that kind of creates this nice like separation in the workflows that allows a data scientist to go faster. And it's super easy to maintain. Uh, it, it's super easy to maintain. It's kind of like automated in the system and the, and the, the pipelines are pre-built. So, um, uh, so just some kind of like, as an example, some quick details on Tekton's aggregations engine, right? Less than one second feature freshness, less than 10 milliseconds serving latency, super efficient backfills. It supports broken historical data. It supports full SQL and Python UDFs, supports extreme scale, super cost optimized. It's really hard to get something like that, but these are the kinds of features you want for your for your fraud models. And it's it's kind of tough to have uh, you know, your data scientists implementing this stuff. Uh, so let's look at like a quick example, you know, building a feature set without, now let's see like what this all means, right? Building your feature set, imagine we have some features, use your country code, uh, like a batch SQL query, transaction, total transaction dollars in the last five minutes, you know, a couple of other features. 
if these are our features, uh, some are batch, some are streaming, some are real time. Uh, and I have to build all these features and I have to build the, the implementation for the features and orchestration of the pipeline and everything behind the scenes for every single feature that's built. Uh, some of them, it's easy running this, running like a, you know, a SQL query can be quite easy and maybe I already have that solved. But for a lot of these other kinds of features, you know, like the aggregations we were just talking about, it can be really hard to implement that. Um, and, and so, you know, the beauty of, of, of implementing these features with a feature engine is that it, it kind of turns it into easy mode for all of these features, right? Now I just use an aggregation feature engine for these. I use the real-time Python feature engine for this one. And, um, and then I can use all these features side by side in the feature platform. So the feature platform te treats all the features the same because they all implement the same feature interface. The feature platform allows you to manage, work with, serve, read from, interact with all the features in the exact same way. So then when you say, hey, I'm making a prediction, I need a feature vector, you get feature values from all of the features um, side by side, just like the, you know, through one common interface. And when you get this kind of easy mode for these features that used to be hard to do, they used to be hard to build, it's nice because you can build all the features you wanted. Before, you know, it was such a pain, you would have, you would implement many fewer features than you would be interested in having. But now you can build all the features you need because it's just way faster to build and productionize and maintain this stuff. And so we're seeing actually, you know, folks who use the, the aggregation feature engine in Tekton, they have a ton more features because it's, it's actually like cheaper, but faster for them to build. And their models get a lot more accurate from them. So really quick on feature engines, they're powerful, configurable implementations of common feature patterns. They make it easy to build production ready feature pipelines. And they're offered, you know, they're part of the feature platform and they enable feature engineering at scale. And they, they basically speed up the time to production, they lower cost, simplify ML. They think that the most important part though is the speeding up. If, if your team it goes a lot faster, instead of it taking months, it takes a day to build, implement, deploy a feature, then you get so many more iterations in over the course of a year and your models get way, way better. And not only that, you become a lot more reactive as a fraud risk detection team. Uh, so that's pretty, uh, that's, that's one of the biggest values. So I recommend considering like a, like a feature, um, a feature engine as a little bit of like a feature engineering pattern that you could use in your organization. Um, you know, we have some stuff like that at Tekton, but you know, you can also like implement this type of pattern internally within your company as well. Okay. That's what I got. Um, I, don't, I haven't checked if there's any questions, but let me uh, hand over to you, uh, Dimitrios. Thanks for your attention, got, everybody. Yeah, I got uh, you covered on questions. And okay. <laughs> while we are waiting, because there is a bit of a delay from when we talk now until people on the stream see it and they give the questions start coming in. Oh, gotcha. I realized something uh, I, that I don't know. Are you a movie buff? I feel like if you were a movie buff, you would have the best name because you could just say to people, I am DB. <laughs> yes. I, <laughs> no one ever told me that before, but uh, <laughs> uh, I was at a, I was at a, a comedy show for my 16th birthday and I had, I was at the front and I was, my feet were up on this, like kind of leaning on the stage and the comedy guy, the comedian goes, I've seen you in a movie before, haven't I? I said, no. I don't know. He's, I'm not an actor. You're not. No, you're definitely an actor. I've seen you before. No, man. I don't know. You got the wrong guy. Yeah. You're not an actor. No, you're not. You don't perform your, or anything. No. And he goes, then get your effing feet off the stage. Oh. <laughs> Just got me because I was leaning up on the stage. And it was such a, such a, oh. such a moment. Uh, yeah. Remember, <laughs> respect those comedians. So they'll come now after I've got you, PTSD huh? related to acting. <laughs> All right. So first question coming through for you, uh, IMDB, there is, oh, and classic, of course, somebody's going to ask this one. What role can or does generative AI LLMs have <laughs> in fraud detection at present or in the near future, especially through Tekton? Great. Okay. So there's, there's two, uh, there's there's two ways to look at it. There's kind of like what 
role does generative AI have with the problems we're solving today? And then what role does uh, the kind of like kind of Tekton and this type of architecture have in generative AI? Uh, and so what role does generative AI have in the problem we're solving today? You know, when we talk to our customers, we talk to folks who are like basically ML teams who are solving real-time fraud problems, uh, either they have, they have to make decisions faster than generative AI can support, or they're not trying to be generative. They're not trying to invent things. They're trying, they're not trying to, uh, kind of be creative. They're trying to take very structured data and make very specific decisions, uh, that are highly accurate. And so, so it's kind of this domain where errors, accuracy is, is, is really important. And you're, you, you're a lot more willing to invest the time in engineering up front to get that, uh, that, that outcome and that accuracy. And so we see uh, generative AI not be the top priority for folks who are doing real-time fraud detection, real-time risk decisioning. However, there's a lot of places where, where there's like adjacent use cases for generative AI where, you know, maybe you're asking the customer another question. Uh, you know, in your chat bot, you're asking, it's almost, almost like a CAPTCHA or there's a customer support thing or all of those kinds of things. And a lot of this infrastructure, a lot of these patterns that we just talked about are very useful for um, from providing uh, context as part of the prompt that is passed into the LLM. And we actually have a blog post on the LangChain blog about uh, feature platforms, feature stores, uh, and LangChain and LLMs and how they can work together to provide a better customer experience. Uh, if you can use those uh, feature infrastructure to, to provide a really high quality real-time context in your prompts such that the LLM can provide a more personalized answer. Mm. I love that. And thinking about it as like a CAPTCHA and you're just giving more context to the LLM. And also something you said there is that you're not trying to be generative in some of these use cases. That is such a good point. Like you can't just the use case latency requirements that you have. Sometimes I, a lot of people are talking about this in the, L, in the ML ops community and they're saying how they get like 40 minutes worth of waiting for a response and then chat GPT just comes back and says, oop, timeout error. And so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not, that's not relevant for these use cases where you're exactly. like, Hey, we got to make a uh, decision right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but also your you, the data you're trying to process is not, it is often not um, like unstructured. Like we don't know what kind of data we're going to get, we're going to get as input. So we need a, a very flexible LLM to be able to interpret on the fly. You can build in all of that interpretation because you're interested in effectively like overbuilding this thing to provide a very deterministic, correct, highly accurate result rather than, uh, you know, building a, for a lot of these use cases, building like a generic system that can interpret any type of situation, any type of input data. That's kind of like not the, not the uh, problem setup for a lot of the risk and fraud decisioning. Uh, systems that a lot of uh, folks I'm imagining in this community have. Exactly. So while we're on the topic, who hallucinates more chat GPT or your average college student? Definitely college student. Um, I mean, depends on which college, obviously, but from <laughs> when I was in college, <laughs> I'm going to exactly. go with uh, so, option B on that one. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a few more questions for you, and then we're going to kick you off the stage politely. Uh, Justin is asking, does the feature store automatically handle train, test, validate splits without breaking aggregations? Interesting. Uh, that actually, that doesn't happen right now. Um, so the, so there's, there's ways that you can kind of look into it and, and say, Hey, uh, based on the length of this feature aggregation, um, I want to, I want to smartly choose my train serve split but the but the way that features are calculated today is uh they use uh like an, a time window uh, a feature for you know january 1st if it's a month-long aggregation it's going to use data from december so so there's different ways to do uh train serve splits train or train validate test splits and if you're slicing by time, that's always hard when you have an aggregation that aggregates over time, because then your feature 
kind of uses data from a time range. And so it's, mm. and so if you have, especially if you have a lifetime feature, like a lifetime aggregation, that data goes back forever. And so you, you, you can't really just say, okay, now I'm never going to use this data for these features, right? But the thing you can do is slice by um, uh, users or by items or by merchants, by, ID, by entity, by ID. You say, I'm going to train on these users. I'm going to uh, validate on these users. I'm going to test on these users. And that's uh, a pretty common pattern where uh, that ev evades the leakage problems that are introduced by having a time dimension aggregation. Mm. I love that. All right. So does aggregation engine keep feature lineage to help with explainability? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I, I can just speak to like what we have in Tekton, but if you go into Tekton, um, all the features, every feature that's defined in the, in the feature platform of Tekton has lineage, feature catalog, owner, all the metadata associated with it, everything all in the same way. So every feature, independent of how it's implemented, is treated and managed and, and organized uh, in the same way and governed in the same way and monitored in the same way. So you don't have to worry about like, oh, this is a specialized feature pipeline that we needed to implement for some certain, whatever reason it is. It connects to a weird data source or it's a specialized compute or something. You don't have to worry about that being kind of like handled, like kind of living in a silo. It's all kind of goes through the same management platform, which uh, makes it really nice. All right, last one for you, then you're out of here. <laughs> We're giving you the musical, you know, in the yeah. Oscars or the Emmys. Yeah, the hook. So the how, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. How and when is the feature aggregation triggered by streaming window at streaming or by service call at runtime? Uh, so at Tekton and in, in the Tekton implementation, it could be configured to be either. So there's a pretty, there's a parameter and you can define what type of aggregation you're interested in. It can be as of the point in time when the prediction is being made so like right now for the last 30 minutes or it could be from the last event to the th past 30 minutes before that or it could be every five minutes it's recomputed or something like that too so there's different ways to do it um, and that's some like a configuration uh, type of thing but that's a really good question because like that those details are actually the like messy details that make it really hard to implement this stuff. Cause you might think, Oh, like I can build yeah. like an aggregation, but then, but then you actually think, Oh, it's really easy to build one of those, but then you actually need the other thing. And then it's like a completely different implementation. And so it's kind of one of these problems. I've, I've, we, I think we've talked about this um, like apply before, where it's one of these problems where the deeper you dig into it, like the harder you realize the problem gets. And, mm -hmm. and if you, and so we see, talk to a lot of teams who are start like staffing up a team to, you know, build this kind of thing. And then they realize, Oh crap, like this is, we're going to need more people. And then it's like more people and it just kind of grows. So, yeah. yeah. As they, as one person said in the MLOps community who was trying to build a feature store at their company, they were talking about the pains and they said, it's basically like death by a thousand cuts. Yeah. I think that's, that's right. <laughs> well, that's all we do is we, uh, you know, we, we solve the thousand cuts thing uh, at that yeah. There you go. <laughs> so, with that, thank you, Mike. I'm not sure if you're jumping back on later, but it's been a pleasure. It always is a pleasure. And yeah, no, I'm excited to watch the rest of the day. So I'll let you guys, uh, I'll, I'll seed the stage. <laughs> All right, here we go. Thanks for your attention, everyone. See ya. See ya.